We're saying goodbye to the rigid numbers and strict budgets and putting relationships back at the heart of personal finance. This is more than a podcast. It's an invitation to reimagine your money story and journey with us through a landscape of intuitive strategies and abundance. Join a community that nurtures transformative financial mindsets. Welcome to Intuitive Finance. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Intuitive Finance with Dylan Bain. I've got another interview coming at you. This time, it is Dimitra Gray. Dimitra is a writer whose outspokenness has gotten her into many rounds of trouble. She lives on a little island off the west coast of Canada with her husband, Jordan, and shares about her life. She's also the host of a wonderful podcast called The Dimitra Gray Show, and you can find her at DimitraGray.com or on Instagram at DimitraGray with two underscores. Now, ladies and gentlemen, when we rebranded from Fiscally Savage into Intuitive Finance, my goal was to create something more inviting and for us to really talk about relationships and truth. And I have to say, when Dimitri agreed to be on the podcast, I was overjoyed because she is one of the people who has really taught me about being able to find what's true for me and be able to live that out loud. So without further ado, welcome Dimitri to the podcast. And I'm, we're going to have a great interview. Thanks for listening. Dimitri Gray, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. <laughs> Fantastic. I, I've been following your work for a couple of years at this point, and I'm, I'm super excited to have this conversation. But I would like to kind of start with your work on intuition and talking about trusting yourself and letting that guide you through life. Can you just give us like the 30,000 foot view of, of that in your life as, it, as that's brought you to where you're at? Hmm. Well, it's interesting because actually that's like the quality that's been most shaken up for me in the last couple of years. But so I can tell you how I did relate to it and then how I relate to it now. So I have always had this sort of deep faith in life and in, in trusting life. And I think that that largely comes from a trust in ourselves and a trust in ourselves to handle whatever life gives to us. I think, yeah, for me, you might know my younger brother was in a car accident when I was 19 and he was 17. And that was kind of like the the first most traumatic event of my life. And then I went through a lot of losses after that. And it was early on to realize that nobody really knows anything at all. Like, I think when I was younger, I was, like, waiting to get to be an adult and get to this place where, like, people know what's going on and, like, all these adults older than me, they have it figured out and I'm going to, like, get to this place where they... I, I understand life and they understand life. And when that happened so young and I was in hospitals for a long time, my brother has a, a brain injury and... I had left university and I was just in this really lost place and just being like, oh, nobody knows anything. Mm -hmm. And like I could die and like he, my brother could have died. Anyone could die at any moment. And what is the point of anything? And I started listening instead of listening to these external sources of what society expected from me and my parents expected from me. I was like, well, if nothing has any point, was kind of how I felt at the time, then I'm just going to listen to me. Like, if I have, if I don't have much time to live, then I better live in a way that I actually want to be living. And so I started just listening to what I felt was true. And I've always had this sort of connection to, you could call it my intuition, you could call it truth you could call it some sort of spiritual connection any way you want to frame it but I could tell when some and I think all people feel this but I think it gets really buried down and so I would be able to tell things like oh this relationship isn't right for me anymore and I think most people might feel it but then they question and they question and I started very young feeling that and listening and just being like I know that this is the next thing for me and and yeah, I mean, the next 11, 12 years of my life since then has been, it, it led me on a big journey of a lot of different places to live and people and jobs. And, and yeah, I would say that's still the way I relate to it now. Uh, 
as you've seen in my posting, my whole journey led me accidentally into a spiritual cult. And so I, I I mean, I think that's the foundational thing that gets shaken up in that, right? It's like your trust. Like for a long time, it was like, how did I, how did I, how can I trust myself at all if, if it led, if I, if my intuition led me to that place? And what I've realized is that there's nothing actually wrong with my intuition. It's just that I think we have to develop this discernment of we can be tricked and like there are some people who are not good people. And 100%. Having intuition doesn't protect us from the world. Well, exactly. And there, there are people, there's an entire industry of people who will like use those intuition cues to suck you into a place. And then, then what they do is they create a bunch of static. I, I, I want to go back to one thing that you said because I thought it was just beautiful when you were saying like, your brother's in this accident when you're 19, you're suddenly like, oh my God, what's the right answer here? I imagine your parents are grieving, right? They're grieving the loss of, of the man he could be. You're, 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 you're grieving the loss of who your brother could be and all those possibilities that come closing down. And as, as younger children, <laughs> we are still children and on so many different levels there, having to, to come to terms with the fact that my you know mom and dad don't know what to do. You know, I feel like there's such a longing for the quote unquote right answer in what what is the right thing to do here. And I, I see this a lot in my coaching practice where people come in and they're like, tell me what to do. I can't tell you what to do. I can I can tell you what, what might work, but but you we gotta find this yourselves. Talk to me a little bit more about being coming uncomfortable, like the, the comfortability between the idea that there's something certainty there's something certain out there. And the idea that there maybe isn't something certain out there. <laughs> These are some big questions still in there. <laughs> but did you expect I me think... to come in soft? <laughs> <laughs> No, and it's so, I mean, these are the things that I'm currently really sitting with a lot. I think we all want that certainty, right? I've been reading this book called Cultish, which is like about, it's about just language in our society today, like language, just advertising language, just like all the language that we hear in our society all the time. And something that she, the author wrote about, which I found really interesting was that she said how this sort of generation, millennials, around like people who are becoming more of adults now, grew up for the first time really being told like, you can do absolutely anything you want to do. You can be anything you want to be. There's like endless options. There's the whole internet. You can see everyone doing everything and you have all of these choices. And then you get to be an adult and then you're kind of like, it's so overwhelming to have so many choices and be told like you can be absolutely anything. You could do anything. You could go anywhere. Like, <laughs> exactly. And that often people then get like when, then when we meet someone who is so certain and they claim like, I'm certain about life and I know the way that life is. We're so drawn to that because often people who, who are in that place feel just like, I just want someone to like, tell me what to eat, what to do what to how to work out what to just like what to believe just tell me how to be so I don't have to decide in all these options and so I think when it like nothing's certain right and that can be really destabilizing and at the same time there is a certainty in like the reality of life that we live in we're like here as humans together and I think that a lot of my life has been navigating this place and after my brother was in his accident it wasn't just like oh he's in the accident now we grieve it was like years I mean it still kind of is in this place but in the it was like he was in a coma and it was like is he gonna wake up is he not gonna wake up is he gonna die any day now and it was like months on end of this constant like he could die at any second and like, is he stable? And what's his brain doing? And all of these things. And so I, I got a very quick schooling in everything's uncertain all the time. And that was when I got, I started my sort of spiritual journey. I got really into yoga and I like went down all these paths. And I think, I mean, I think what I'm currently trying to find is this place of like, I, I think in ways I've still been searching for the certainty, like where's the person who's going to tell me what to do? You can think about it even in terms of health. I go to like a natural wellness person. I'm like, is this person kind of crazy? They're like an alternative person. Maybe I should listen to the actual doctor. And then I go to the actual doctor and they're so disembodied and like <laughs> totally. No, I'm like, I can't trust you either. I can't trust that. Like, 
I can't trust anyone. How do we know? And so we have to, I think, come back to this place of I can trust me. And that doesn't mean I'll never make mistakes. Like we have all of life to make mistakes and and learn and grow. Well, and it, I don't know if that answered your question. But I mean, it, it always brings up more questions than answers, right? Like that's the best part about it. I mean, there, there is a, a certain level of growth that, that occurs where we get to, yes, everything. Because my, my path was very similar of saying, go to college. You know, once you get that piece of paper, you're set for life. So I went to college having no idea why I was there, got my piece of paper, and then it was like, I was like, well, now what? They're like, well, get a job. And I was like, how do you do that? I spent four years getting this piece of paper. You, you told me that there would be a job waiting for me. And it wasn't until I was just like, no, 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 I, I'm not. I'm done listening to what the approved path is. I'm going to do my own thing that it actually worked out. But that, that, that longing for certainty and the discomfort, like I feel like that's where a lot of these cults will come in. I mean, you can see this in the medical community. You already brought up alternative care. And I loved your statement about disembodied doctors. You come in and you're like, oh my God, my, my, my guts are hurting. I don't know what's going on. They're like, yeah, here's a pill. Academically, statistically, you're fine. Have a good day. And you're like, but the statistics don't make me warm at night, man. <laughs> yeah. So when you're going through these, these different journeys, because I know in, in some of your writings, you've talked about getting so close to like checking the approved box and then being like, this isn't right. And there's a part of me internally that's like, oh my God, well, why? But there's another part of me that's like, wow, what? I wish I had that level of bravery. Hmm. Talk to me about the pulls on that and how, how the, the juxtaposition between that guides you through your decision making. The juxtaposition between what? Bravery and and staying comfortable? Yeah. So so like you know, the idea of like, oh, there's a certainty of I'm going to check this box, right? I'm going to do the thing hmm. everyone told me to do, get a license, get a credential, whatever, versus this doesn't feel true to me. And I don't know what's yeah. on the other side, but that's the path that I, I feel drawn to. Not mm -hmm. from a place of fear, but from a place of opportunity. I think that it gets easier the more you do it. And I'm glad whenever I talk to people about this, I feel so lucky that I started as young as I did. And I think life just sort of forced me into that. But the more that I find that I have done that, the more evidence I gather that that is the right thing to do, right? And so, like, when, for example, I left university four different times. Like, I went to four different schools. I quit all of them. And the last one I quit a semester before I would have graduated. And so it was, like, over whatever, six years, I had been to four different schools, and it, everyone was like, you are insane. And I was like, I'm insane. Just, like, do one more semester. Finish it. Get the thing. But I was like, I'm never going to use this. Like I was going to get, I had changed my major like eight times, but I was in a history major, my last one. And I was like, for a while I played with, maybe I'll go get my PhD in history. And it was like, I'm never going to do that. What am I going to do with it? I'm going to go be a professor. Like that's not me. And I, I just, I can look back at each time I quit school. It was like a really big lesson for me. Because like the second time that I quit the first time I quit was because of my brother, but the third time that I quit, I ended up just, and it was this feeling of like, I'm not going to be here when I have no idea what I'm doing. I have no idea what I want to do. It's pointless. Like I'm not. And so I was like, I'm just going to take a semester off. I'm going to take a step back. And what I ended up doing at that time, I was, I was 22, I think is I ended up, I was teaching yoga and I ended up meeting someone and it turned into this opportunity and I ended up opening my own yoga studio. And so at 22, I owned a yoga studio and I was in charge of managing it. And I had to learn like all of these things, like making a website, making an email list, all these different tasks. And I ended up getting sick of it and selling it close to a year later. But, and then I like traveled and I did all these things and then I ended up going back to school. But it was like, quitting that last time, it was like, look, every other time I've quit, it's led me to something really beautiful that I would never have planned or guessed would happen. And so I started to develop this trust. Like I just started to notice that every time I like leapt off the cliff and I was like, this is terrifying. I ended up in a place where I had these experiences that I just never, ever would have had if I had stuck to this sort of path that everybody says. But it's hard. I honestly think I still have this teeny part of me that is like, 
why can't you just be like a normal person? <laughs> just like get a normal <laughs> job. Do normal. Like I look at people that I know, especially like extended family members, and I'm like, they have such a normal life. Like they have normal friends that they were friends with from high school and call it, and they have like just what I imagine to be this normal, like kind of set path that makes sense. And it was just never my path, but but I never could have done the other thing. Right. It never would have been fulfilling. And I think every every choice that I've made, I know that when I die, even if I died tomorrow, I will be very content with the way that I've lived my life. Every choice that I've made, it's been very important to me that I'm making a choice that I can live with and that I like reach not just the end of like we have to live with ourselves in every moment, right? But I also like that I reach the end of my life and feel like, yeah, like I'm proud of all of these decisions I made were the right ones for me. And I didn't do them based on what other people thought I should do. Amazing. It, you know, when you're talking about you know, the other people with normal lives, it reminds me of when I first came back to my hometown. So my, my whole plan was to live and die my, my entire life in southeastern Wisconsin. Then the recession hit, and I, I found a woman who was like not going to stay there with me. And so I followed her overseas. And when I came back to my hometown, I realized that I had outgrown it. Like everybody else, they, all the all of my friends from high school, they all married each other. Then they got divorced. They all stood up, moved one person over, sat back down, remarried. And but they have these like huge roots in this area where they're like so rooted to the to the city and its history and everything else like that. And so there's a part of me that's like a kid at a, a candy shop, like looking in the window, being like, "Oh, I wish I had that." And there's another part of me that's like, "Yes, but I've." Whenever I tell them the life I've led since I've left there. It's as if I'm telling them that I slay dragons and that I ride unicorns. Like They're like, oh, my God, that'd be amazing. It was like, well, I, I sold my whole, I sold my car. I sold my house. I sold everything. And I got on a plane and just went, I hope I have a job when I land. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's that trust. I mean, it's there was a point in time I was very, very close. It was around the time that I had owned the yoga studio and I was young and I, I was dating – a boy who I really, really loved, and he had been my brother's best friend, and we had this really sweet, loving relationship. There was nothing wrong with it, and we were talking about maybe getting married and maybe, like, getting a house together, and th there was this moment where I was like, maybe I could live in small-town Pennsylvania forever, and I can get a cute house, and I can have some animals, and I can teach yoga, and I can marry this man who is, he's, like, a contractor and builds things, and this could be my life, and it was like, it was so nice on paper and like the inside of me just wanted to like wither away and die. And it was just, I can't do that to myself. Amazing. Amazing. And <laughs> on so many levels, so much of, of your story, like it resonates really deeply with me because of how much it rhymes. My, my mother always mm -hmm. encouraged me like, do the safe thing, Dylan, just stick it out. What you have isn't bad. And just saying like, but I'm not content. I'm not, I meant for more than this. I want to write epic stories and tell epic tales and just like chafing against that. But at the same time, like there's this cacophony of family members and friends, people who I believe legitimately care about me, who are telling me mm -hmm. like, don't put us through this like <laughs> don't jump off the cliff and build a plane on the way down so you had that opportunity when you look back at it was it was it a situation where you're like oh my god this is too comfortable or was it a situation of like no this just didn't feel true what led you to say thanks but no thanks to what anyone else would say was like the mm -hmm. perfect win mm-hmm I mean, I've done that so many times, and I think that we all have this inner voice that that often wants more or knows that more is possible, and everybody else is so trained to not listen to that voice, and they're, like, terrified of their own voice because it might change their life or blow it up or whatever, and so everyone else is like, no, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, and when you do it, like, before I met Jordan, my husband, I was... In another relationship, that was great. We had been best friends for eight years, and it was wonderful, and I felt really in love, and I just felt like this feeling of, like, this isn't enough. Like, I want someone who matches me. 
I want to be inspired by someone. I'm tired of feeling like I'm the inspiring one who does all these cool, weird things and tries to drag other people along. I was like, I don't want that. But it was scary to feel like, who am I to assume that like I could have what the most of what I want in someone in my life like and when I look at my life now I feel this kind of satisfaction of like every time that I wasn't sure and every time that everybody else was like don't do these things like I ended up here which is a really beautiful place to be like where I currently am and it's like we don't get to that place I think where we're like so satisfied unless we listen again and again and again to that thing where it's like you said like it's just like jump off and just be like okay, I hope something catches me. Like, I hope. And I think what that trust is, it's actually the trust in ourselves. Like, we can, we feel like we're trusting life. And I think we do. Like, maybe people have different spiritual beliefs of, like, God or what might be there with them. But it's also this faith in ourselves to be like, I can make this choice. Because I know that no matter what happens, I will react well. I will handle it well. I trust that if everything falls apart, I still have me. And I like me. And I like me because I listen to me. And I teach myself that I'm worth listening to. And so since I have this sort of relationship with myself, then no matter what happens, I'm okay. I think that's where that comes from. Like being able to do that. And and I think it's learned by practice that's what people don't want to hear because the first time is the hardest time and then the first few times are the hardest because you have to develop this sort of evidence that like oh when I'm absolutely terrified and I'm afraid that if I do this the whole world is going to end oh it doesn't end and actually wow look where it led me but if you don't do it ever it's easy to create all these stories that like yeah well and and you can't in those stories it's gonna go badly yeah, I mean the story in the stories of like why we did what we did, right? Like we only it's we we go back and we we recontextualize it. I I remember in in 2014, my principal, when I was a teacher at the time, my principal calls me in and asks me to commit fraud. And when I said no, she threatened my job and used my kids as What kind of fraud? She wanted me to go back and change grades so that the graduation records would look right because we had had a 100% graduation rate and my class was required, so if these students who earned their Fs in my class, if they failed, they wouldn't graduate. And our graduation rate would be tarnished. And then we would get punished by cutting funding. And I, I told her no. Oh. And her, her exact words were to me, jobs are hard to come by in this town. And maybe you should think about what type of man your daughter needs you to be. A liar? <laughs> <laughs> well, in her mind, she was trying to tell me like, oh, you need to be a provider. You need to, you need to hold on to this job for her. And my second daughter wasn't around yet. It was just my oldest. But I remember going home and I got, I put my daughter to bed. I actually called in sick to my third job that night and I got real drunk because I didn't know what else to do. So that just seemed like the obvious thing to do. So I got real drunk and I was looking at out my back window to this drainage ditch that was my backyard. It was literally a storm drainage ditch. And I was thinking of like, there's got to be more. Like there's got to, there's just got to be more like this. I'm better than this. Like, I, I'm worth more than this. It just, like, was like, the first time in my life I kind of felt like I was, like, hatching out of an egg of, like, no, mm. we're not doing this anymore. And the next day I walked in and I, I told my principal, I said, I'm not doing that. And she sucks her teeth and, you're making a bad decision. And I was like, and furthermore, you can go fuck yourself. And those words came out of my mouth before I had any clue <laughs> they were even there. And I told my wife, Dominique, I was like, I think I just quit my job today. <laughs> And she was like, what are we going to do? Like, she freaked out. And I was like, I don't know. But I'm done betting on everyone else. I'm done betting on the system. I'm done betting on this principle. I'm done betting on on everything else. I'm betting on me. Because I know I'm going to pay off. And I remember my mother called me like three days later. And she like, go back and talk to the principal. Apologize. You were hung over. You can salvage this. And I was like, no. No. I Even if I could, I'm not doing it. And mm-hmm. I look back at that, and it was like, what a leap of faith, because I had no no backup, <laughs> no plan, no nothing. And then look where it's brought me, right? It's brought me to mm-hmm. this conversation with you. Like, this is a direct result of me saying, yeah, the, the man my daughter needs me to be is a man of integrity. And yeah. that integrity started with being integrous with myself. And so, like, mm-hmm. that is a huge part of this conversation, 
to me is like when I got to a point where I, I was like, oh, I don't know what else to do. You and Jordan's work walked into my life. And it was like, oh, wait, mm -hmm. you, you can do that? You could just, you, you were speaking to something that I'd experienced, but I didn't have words for. And the idea that mm -hmm. like, oh, there is this intuition, you can trust yourself. And I'll, I'll be in, put all my cards on the table. My first thing was like, this is utter bullshit. This idea of being like open to the universe, like this sounded so woo woo. And I was like, is this a cult? Like I literally actually had that. Like, is this a cult? It's a good question. To <laughs> ask. But th that's also been the thing of like, even in this podcast of like opening myself up and be like, okay, I've done 80 episodes. I want to do some interviews. I asked 13 people, 13 people said, yes, I expected six at most. So like mm -hmm. being open and being right with myself has brought so much more to me. But at the same time, I don't believe in things like the law of attraction, right? I don't believe that I could just sit, think and grow rich. Yeah. There's a work component yeah, yeah. to that as well. Totally. Yeah. And I, I think it's, I love that story because it's so like that to me, it says a lot about the man that you are and the type of person that you are. Because a lot of people in that moment, like their job is threatened. There's this chance to just do this thing that no one will ever find out about. But it's like what I was talking about before. You have to live with that then. And I think that there is something else you're speaking to there that's really important. And like that I think that there is this sort of sense of right and wrong and this sense of integrity. And that's something I've been that I've always had and I really have been sitting with a lot in this last year of my life is just like there's something in that that's that not all people have and it is something that I think is worth protecting it's like the honesty and the innocence I think it's innocence in a way too it's just like this this innocence of life this sense of what is right and what is honest and it's been a big wake up call for me to realize that, like, I think I always thought people were that way. But it's like, actually, maybe I don't know what percentage of people are what way. But there's certainly people like the principal who will like do just be like, eh, and it doesn't bother them or maybe it bothers them, but they don't care as much. And then there's people who don't aren't bothered at all. And they just lie all the time. And it's like, those are sociopaths. I, yeah. <laughs> but I think it's it's. It makes sense to me that, like, you have gotten to where you are based on that quality of just being like, no, I'm not doing that. And watch me, like, trust myself and do something else because I'm not going to be that kind of person. Yeah. Well, it, it, and I also think that there's a, a huge component of once you start choosing you, everyone else starts choosing you too, right? Because mm -hmm. I, I, right after that, after I told my principal where she'd go, go stick it. I actually, the, she sent one of her minions, the vice principal down to talk to me <laughs> and she sat me down and she was like, Dylan, everyone, we have to be flexible. We all make compromises. And I was like, what compromise, what was your first compromise? And it, it was amazing because that was such a, for me, I was in, I was in such an embodied state of groundedness of like, no, I'm not moving. I'm a rock. That question again, it came out of my mouth and I watched her go through all the stages of grief right across her face. And I was like, oh my God. Your first compromise was not leaving this town. And I asked her, I was like, have you ever thought about living outside of Flagstaff? And she just got up and walked out of my room. Oh, my God. And, <laughs> and, That's when you knew you were meant to be a coach. <laughs> yeah. And I, I was like, what? Well, at, at that point, my, my sole focus was I wanted to be somebody who counted. I want to be a decision maker. So I was going for the be in the room where it happens. But that sense of like asking the next question of like doing the experiment. And it, it's funny because even in my, my corporate job as an auditor, that's what I do all day long. Of like, what's the next question? What's the next thing? What's the next experiment? And as I've planted my flag more, I've earned more money. I've become more powerful and I'm more sought after. And it sounds like throughout your journey, that was a very similar thing of like, no, I'm, I'm going to do what's right for me. And then there was that, that one incident where you had the person brought you into a cult because there was still a thirst for certainty. Would you be comfortable talking about what it's like waking up out of that experience? Oh, man, it was really rough. Not just the cult, but there's also like, and, and it, I mean, it's cultish, like a lot of things are cultish today. A lot of the new age, like I've been really involved in the new age world 
it was the first thing I found after my brother's accident happened. And I told, like, I went really into yoga and being a yoga teacher. And I actually had this moment where I, I left entirely. Like, I quit the studio and I went off to Greece to do, like, social justice kind of stuff. And I just, like, I was like, I don't want anything to do with this world at all. But then I, like, got pulled back in. And I think it's it's been quite tricky to to there were a lot of beliefs I picked up along the way like throughout the last 10 years of my life and especially the last five years that were very like you're a hundred percent responsible for everything that happens to you you're the the sole creator of your whole entire life and ways that I had sort of been living and seeing things that I believed or I believed at least to an extent like it I think when we get taught these things and we believe these things, our minds start to form around them in a way. Like, then it it makes up all our thoughts throughout the day. Like, we start to have our, our view, like, we're looking through this particular lens. And, um, so joining the cult was just sort of, uh, I had already been having these beliefs coming in to my world. But then when I joined, it was like, it was with someone who could manipulate things to, I, I I didn't know what it was like to be manipulated. I thought I was way too smart to be manipulated. And leaving, I just think that it was like everything shattered entirely. Like for a good long time, it was like, I, I don't know if any of these things were ever true because realizing like, oh, I've just been programmed with these beliefs and being able to see like, kind of the whole web of how all of these things get held up and like all of this sort of like a lot of people use new agey beliefs to be abusive to other people and it gets tricky because there's truth in it too right like you found some truth like you said like you don't believe in the law of attraction stuff but you also have noticed that like when you open to life there's something that happens in response and so I think it's it's learning to form our own relationship with these things, but being careful to not go to someone who says they have all the answers and they're enlightened and they've figured it out and they're like this special guru who like knows better. I think we, there's a lot of places to be careful. There's, you've probably heard of the book, Women Who Run With The Wolves. (laughs) It's less than 20 feet from me right now. (laughs) It's a great book. But something the author of that book says is, I don't know if it's in the book or if she, it's just a quote by her, but it's something like every, every like, I'm going to butcher it, but it's like every dweller of the forest, like everyone who lives in the forest has to learn that there is always predator and there's prey. And I think it's just an important thing. I didn't learn it in my life until I learned it very intensely that like there's, there's always, no matter how law of attraction and uh, open we are to, sometimes the more open we are to things, the less discernment we have, the less, like, we're so trusting that then we don't have any boundaries. And so it's, it's constantly sort of cultivating this, how can I be open to life, but also be this sort of, mm, like parent in a way, like a good parent. You're probably that way with your daughters, right? Like, like how do I protect you from things that I know are bad while also letting you be you and like explore? 100%. I, I have a, a teacher of mine, mentor of mine, who's who's fallen into my orbit in the most weird way. And, and she does a lot with like nature-based therapy. And one of the things mm. she says is that you you can always tell the unnatural by that which is static. Yeah, you know, when it, mm. and and she talks about like the like natural human progressions and, and how humans you know, interact in this world. And her point is is that anything that's dogmatic, anything that's like we have found, we have solved the equation, is wrong, <laughs> because the equation isn't by, by by because it's human, because it's human experience and humans are of nature. It is a constantly evolving thing. And I think mm. about like that with jobs, my, my grandfather, like, just get a job at a factory. And I was like, Grandpa, all the factories are closing. Right. And like, but that was him. That was what was true. That was the that was the answer for him. And my dad was like, get your degree, you get a degree, and you're perfectly fine. And I look at it. And I'm like, my degree means next to nothing. Right? Like, it, it means mm-hmm. next to nothing. 
And so like that, that to me is the, the big marker for you, even in my own life with the men's work that I do, and I'm mentoring a lot of mm -hmm. young men and I'm coaching a lot of young men. It's interesting to see the people that I used to look up as to as mentors or as leaders. It was like where I've watched one of them and there's two very specific people in my head. One of them ran into a problem and was like, oh, I clearly, I, I ran into this problem because I refused to change. I had moved into a new level of life and the rules are different. And so now I'm just gonna be a student of these new rules. And, and he, is, he has evolved and it's like, wow, you're even more powerful than you were. And the other one, he hit, he had a problem. And then he was like, Nope, Nope, I'm going to double down on what I what what used to work. And it's like, you're going to run into the same wall, we can all watch, we're all watching you do it. And, and to me, that was the difference is that as soon as he ran into this wall, and he was like, I can't change, I'm going to double down everything in that the whole mood in that group changed. It changed. Mm -hmm. He started finding bypassed people to put in positions of leadership. He started helping people bypass around. It's the whole thing of like, well, the stages of grief are I have grief. So acceptance is the end. Just go right there. And it's like, yeah. dude, that doesn't, I've been grieving the loss of my brother since I was five. I can assure you that it doesn't work. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it, it's very yeah. interesting that, that, that dogmatic piece, mm -hmm. I think is, is a big takeaway from what you're talking about. Mm hmm. Yeah. And I, what's interesting in what in what you're saying there. And like, I think it's something that's come up a lot for me is that like a lot of people will criticize that quality. Like when you're saying these two people, like a lot of people have said to me, like, it's a criticism. It's been this way ever since I first started my business is like you change your mind so much. That was like a family member said to me right when I began, they were like, I would never hire you. Like you change your mind all the time. Like who would ever hire you? And I was like, I was so bothered by it. But then I've heard it over and over again. Like every so often someone will come in. I had another person recently come in and she was just like, oh my God, you're like, now you have a whole new identity because I was writing about cults. And she was like, now this is just your new identity. And I've followed you for so long. And like back four years ago, you were doing this thing with menstrual blood and now you're doing this thing. And now <laughs> like, then you were, then you were in this phase. And I was just like, is this supposed to be an insult? Because to me, this is like the point of life. And it's like, you're like, to me, it's like, everything should evolve and i think that when we we might believe what we believe but then when we're shown that it's not true or that there's a problem with it i think it's healthy to then be like oh i have to adapt like something is wrong i need to shift and to be like i don't know everything and let me like just rearrange and just let new parts of me out and I think it's like people prefer people to just stay one thing and like don't change their mind and just always be this way and certain about this thing and when they're shown evidence to the contrary just like stay like if you really believed what you believe then you just stay it's just so bizarre because it's I think it's like to me when I see people that are willing to shift and Jordan and I talk about this a lot because it's like all the people we admire most are that way. Someone I really admire is in this way, you might think is funny, is Robert Plant is my favorite. Mm -hmm. Led Zeppelin was always my favorite ba band. And I think about there's this artist and maybe it's because I, I feel more like an artist in the way that I like live and create and do things. But like he had this most successful thing. And he's been asked so many times, like, come back again and play with, the, like, play with Led Zeppelin and play, do a reunion. And he's just like, no. And he's done, like, if you, I have still listened to his music and his projects throughout the years. And it's like, he just continuously does new things and they're all very different from each other. And he's just still, like, exploring, like, here's what I want to explore. And it's not popular anymore. And he's just like, I don't care. This is what I want to explore. And it's just like, that means something to me. I think that that is, is significant. 100%. I, I, with people who, who get into that aesthetic, I'm always like, you, you, have you stopped learning? Do you think that you, like, have you finally, have you finally found it? And I, it's, it's funny you bring up the Metro blood thing, because that was when Dominique first 
my wife was like, I found this this person. She's really interesting. I was like, okay, I'll Google that. And that was immediately what came up. And I was like, that's out there. <laughs> it's <too> crazy. <laughs> it's not that I'm uncomfortable with, with smearing blood on your face. Like, like that's fine. But it, but like, like what a statement. And I was 26. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, as if that's a normal thing for people at 26 to do, which is actually actually probably not wrong because I've actually thought about this a lot of like watching Traver Bohm, who was on the, the show a couple weeks ago, and he he wrote a book called Man Uncivilized. And in it, he talks about like your cock being medicine. He's like, man, you have to remember that this is this is part of your, your gift in this world. And I've watched, having done work with him over the years now, I've watched as as it's guys come in and they're like, wait, yes, I am a sexual being. This is the sex I want to have. And then like they go through this phase and then I've watched guys get to the end of that phase and they're like, but but I, I want to stay in this phase. And so they stop growing and it's just like, yeah, you're kind of cringe, right? Whereas the other ones are just like, okay, my cock is medicine, but I also want it to be nourishing. And like they go through a whole new phase and then I, I want it to be relational, right? And then, and then, like the the phase that I've watched a lot of guys start going into now is the like, I want to be nourished in a way that's not sexual, mm -hmm. right? Like there's there's and and I've watched at every one of those stages, people look at me like, you used to be cool, or 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 be like like, oh, are you just a blue pill cuck now? Like like I I've seen it all in it. My whole thing is like, no, actually, you're the. It's the exact opposite is true. This man is evolving. And and is eventually going to get from go from the like the one of the guys to the mentor phase of life. And I think mm -hmm. so particularly for men, that's something that's missing. We we're missing a lot of mentors. We're missing and we're really missing elders. And I even see this mm -hmm. even in my own father who's lived his whole life in southeastern Wisconsin. He's an amazing man, he's very powerful. He's also sixty nine years old and breaking down and he's still trying to be just one of the guys. And it's like, dude, you should be an elder at this point. Like you, it, you, you failed to transition in life. And to me, it's just like, mm. I'm now limited in how much I can learn. I'm now limited in my relationship and the depth I can have because I'm going to continue growing and, and, and I wish you would come with me. Yeah. We're all missing elders in that way. It's so important. I, I recently met a man uh, who I'm working with. He's a homeopath, but I feel so lucky to have met him. He must be in his late seventies, I'd imagine, but he's spent a lot of time like living with indigenous people and he has this white hair that's like in braids and it's long and he's just he has this like embodiment that you're just like, oh and then it's like to imagine that we had at one point we would have been surrounded, like we would have had so many examples of that kind of wisdom is just like and I think people are around, there are older people around, but we don't value them in that way. And it's really sad. Well, I, I think there's a, are you familiar with the work of Stephen Jenkins isn't at all? Oh, no, I don't think so. So, so he has a, a massive story. He talks a lot about grief and about how we live in a death phobic society. Every time mm -hmm. I, I listen to anything from him, I like have to, I, I need a couple of days. But he talks about how, as a culture, when we made the tra when we made the journey over the Atlantic to come here, we left our elders at home, and so that meant that our young men, who then became old men, had no one to teach them how to move to the next stage mm -hmm. of life. Wow! And so, so now we have this phantom limb as a society, where like we as a society can never get to a point where like we have enough, or or that we focus on life. It's go focused on production and everything because we don't have elders to go. I've learned over my life that you should actually just go to for beers with your friends or elders enough mm -hmm. to be able to sit down with young men and be like, when you get married, do not lose your friends or to sit down wow. and, and to talk to, to young men about like, I'm having problems with my wife. Well, after six years of marriage, here's what I've learned. Right. Mm -hmm. Instead, they're all trying to be one of the guys. So we have old people. There's plenty of old people, but we have very few elders. And, and like, I'm, I'm very blessed that I have two men in my life that I, I count as my elders. And so I have access to them and I can talk to them and, and I've, I've learned and grown through them. But I, I just think that elderhood is something huge. And I think on the female side, we're missing the same thing. The, 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 the coven of, of, of aunts and, and mothers and grandmothers who, who are there to help a woman bring children in the world and negotiate her first relationships with men, how to, how to control. Like, I remember my mother talking about how my family's very matriarchal and how my great aunt sat her down on her wedding night and explained to her how to deal with the Bane men. And like, here are the tips and tricks that work. And throughout her whole marriage in the first 15 years, 
she would call them and be like, I don't know what I'm doing. And they'd be like, all right, well, come on over, honey. And she'd show up and they'd be like, they'd have iced tea in the backyard <laughs> and like, oh my God. teach her. So they're, but I don't have that. And I don't have that because I, because I don't think it even exists, even if I was in Southeastern Wisconsin still. So. Yeah, it's rare. It's, it's sad that we don't have it. it. I've never heard anyone say that, that it, it makes so much sense that like people came over to America and like left like all the elders were left behind. Yeah. Sad. I mean, it, yeah. it, a lot of my work is focused on helping people get their finances right. Cause I think, I think it's foundational, but I also view our society as intensely anti-human. And so mm -hmm. conversations like this, I, I, I just, I feel so soulful about it with your experiences and, and, and your, your lessons coming up on time. I always ask people like, where can people find more Demetra in their life? Because I, I think your message and your writings have been so influential and so nourishing for both me and my spouse that I'd mm. love more people to be able to find you. Yeah, I think the best place to always go is my website, which is just demetragray.com. My, the best place to hear from me is my email list because that's kind of everything has shifted so much. My business has changed so much and what we are like my husband and I are doing a lot of stuff together currently, like offering things together. But my email list is the best place to hear all of the things in one place. I am a bit back on Instagram now, too, but I've mostly just been writing about cults on Instagram. But my Instagram is Demetra Gray and then two underscores at the end. So so if we want um, cult yeah. content, Instagram, everything else, content. email list. <laughs> Well, my email list gets the cult content too. My email list is the best place to go because I just include everything I'm doing in that place. Amazing. So, Demetra, this has yeah. been an amazing conversation. Thank you so much for coming on. You are so welcome. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening. The conversation doesn't end here. Please share the show with friends and make sure you keep up with all the latest updates on Instagram and threads at the Dylan Bain and dive deeper into the world of finance with me at dylanbain.com where you'll find insights, resources, and strategies to reimagine your money story.